uh, meeting. Got it. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, thanks for participating. Again, um, you know, we're doing the hybrid session, so uh, you will be heard in the room, but um, you know, I guess you can you can raise your hand um, using the little hand icon. Z is monitoring the uh, chat and everything. It'll bring things to our, our attention in the room here. Don't have very many people here in the room, unfortunately, and I guess and we'll circle back on some of the uh, meeting format and frequency uh, conversation towards the end. Um, uh, but uh, happy to have you all participating remotely um, through Zoom. So welcome to uh, uh, quarter three, uh, district D1B, uh, that is like the, the West District uh, of the Olmsted Park System, the Olmsted Community Alliance. Um, hopefully several of you have participated in previous meetings, um, but in terms of our agenda for the day, uh, just gonna do a few introductions, uh, as well as, you know, just very quickly recap for the, the, the purpose of these meetings. Um, then, as we usually do, we make brief presentations sort of expanding the knowledge for everyone of, of the work of the Conservancy and our partnership with the City of Buffalo, Parks Management. Uh, then we'll uh, continue our usual updates on ongoing projects, uh, as well as uh, park issues raised previously. And as, and as always, leave opportunity for new discussions uh, of the day as they come up um, in your use of the park system. So with that, um just uh continuing to re reinforce our key players here I've got myself the director of planning and research uh and a newly minted director of inclusion and engagement z uh here in the room um so you'll get to uh again you've got to know her you get to know her more as we continue along um in terms of our uh of our leadership team <clears throat> who you meet from time to time uh, executive director stephanie crockett uh, Director of Park Administration, uh, handling a lot of capital projects and you know the nuts and bolts of coordination with the city on a lot of things. Greg Robinson, Chief Development Communications Officer, uh, Katie Stevenson, she's bringing in the money uh, and uh, handling a lot of our communications efforts. And then Operations, Director of Operations, Bob Stokes. Here in District 1, uh, um, newly promoted supervisor, Anthony White, and his right-hand man, Devote Pompey, and as well, um, more system-wide folks. Again, there's, there's sort of focus on District 1, and then there's people who roam the entire uh, 850 acres of the Olmsted Park System for forestry, Mike Sawyer, see him from time to time, Charlie Carr handling uh, facilities, all the buildings, buildings work and maintenance, and then uh, out in the circles, Eileen Martin. Um, also joining us today uh, from the city of Buffalo, we've got Taylor Brown, senior engineer, uh, handling uh, a lot of the bike infrastructure projects, as well as capital projects um, throughout the city. So she'll be making a presentation and uh, I'm very excited to have her here with us. Um, in terms of the focus, of the, of, the, of the Alliance and the purpose, the goals we're trying to reinforce every meeting. Uh, again, it's very simple. It's really just about communication, uh, the opportunity for collaboration and connecting across, you know, complex neighborhoods, uh, complex relationships with all of the institutions and uh, leadership in the community, uh, with leadership at the city and, and leadership here at the Conservancy. So the ad opportunity for dialogue is priority number one. Um, with um, people coming to this room as representatives of their community. Um, we also have an objective of continuing to focus, prioritize investments in the park system. We do that at a sort of larger planning level with our five-year plan for priority projects, um, but then really supporting the implementation of that uh, is uh, really the name of the game and making improvements in the parks that uh, are as a result of community uh, conversations and desires. <coughs> and then again, continuing that outreach, continuing that engagement, um, you know, with the, with the idea of increasing awareness, but also engaging uh, the community and stewardship uh, out in the parks and really 
uh, taking an active role in your in your uh, favorite parks and neighborhood parks. So again, we are here doing this uh, in District 1B, the Front Prospect Days um, section, but we do this five weeks in a row, four times a year, uh, and um, you know, representing uh, sort of conversations in each district across the city. Hey, Mary. Um, so with that introduction, we'll move on to the major discussion items of the day. Um, for those in the room, we're able to grab an agenda. Um, but again, we've got a few um, discussion items and then brief project updates, issue updates, events updates, uh, and again, you know, open conversation all along the way. So starting off, um, in terms of the uh, discussion for quarter three, we want to take a focus on operations and maintenance and really uh, getting into the nuts and bolts of our relationship with the city. Um, which, which is a, uh, a public-private partnership um, for the care and attention to the Olmstead Parks. Again, this has been going back to 2004, this uh, partnership. It's been a number of renewed contracts along the way. Um, we're currently under contract through 2029 uh, with a uh, review uh, halfway through that um, process uh, in 2024. Uh, this is a lot of words, a lot of bullets, uh, which we usually try and avoid in, in presentations, but felt it was important just to really lay out all the details of who does what um, in this in this partnership. So with regard to responsibilities of the conservancy, you're going to see maintenance, a lot of a lot of the word maintenance on this list, um, but you know, for turf, trees and gardens, um, sort of that first line of litter pickup, graffiti removal, uh, dealing with the furnishings out in the park, the, the park furnishings, and making sure those are in good shape. Uh, when winter rolls around, managing the walkways, the pathways with snow removal and salting, uh, the day-to-day -day work of keeping all of the athletic courts uh, maintained, cleaned and in operation. Same with the athletic fields, handling the mowing and the um, maintenance of the Marco Clay at baseball, marking fields, et cetera. Uh, with golf courses, we not only do the maintenance, but we manage the golf courses. So uh, basically handling the um, customer service side, but also the maintenance side. Uh, in irrigation, we handle the irrigation systems maintenance. So where we uh, have uh, the uh, benefit of having functional irrigation systems, we're taking care of the maintenance, making sure those are running. Um, the portable toilets contract, we uh, handle that management. Equipment, we handle the maintenance. I got, got repairs in parentheses, so we'll maintain the equipment, grease it, you know, keep the tires in shape, uh, but major repairs, those are handled by the city and city owned equipment. And then with park facilities, we'll handle the cleaning and maintaining of those facilities unless there is a separate vendor uh, contracted um, or sort of separate, separate, separate person running. Um, that facility. An example in this district would be the library, which sits in Prospect Park, uh, but it is obviously uh, run by the library system. City of Buffalo uh, handles the trash pickup. They handle the where we take all of our debris in terms of our disposal, so really getting things out of the park. And then um, with regard to roads, where they handle everything related to roadways inside the curb from the summertime, the street sweeping, the light poles that uh, uh, light, handle everything related to light poles and lighting. Uh, with regard to courts, the resurfacing, so the sort of capital investment into courts uh, and recreational features handled by the city. Any repairs, again, with roadways, covering everything from maintenance and repairs, plowing and salting. And then with back in pathways, um, where we're doing the sort of, uh, the maintenance of pathways, uh, the repairs and parking lot repairs, um, dealing with you know tripping hazards, etc. Uh, that's a city 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 role, city owned equipment repairs, as I mentioned, and the fueling contract, everything related to all the utilities, so storm sewers, all the natural water bodies management, um, and sticking with with water, the ornamental features of uh, uh, ornamental fountains maintenance, turning those on every year, uh, sticking with water again, the public pools, again, the maintenance, but also the management of those pools, 
everything related to infrastructure coming into the parks, uh, structural uh, improvements related to park facilities, use, operation, and safety. Uh, all of the monuments and statues through the Arts Commission, work with them as well. And then with the police department and parking enforcement, dealing with park, park security. So I go through all of this, all of these bullets, all of this information detailed out who does what. Um, but again, the goal here, every step of the way, the sort of magic of the public private relationship is partnership and supporting each other uh, uh, as we can. So that is always the goal through this effort um, is to partner and support. Taking what is a long bulleted list, which we can come back to if there's any questions about this, uh, I do have maps that sort of outline again this park boundary and the care and attention within there, um, but also again highlighting uh, facilities, courts, roadways, and all of our monuments and memorials out in the park and sort of the within front park. Three folks, uh, three 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 groups engaged. In Prospect Park, that grows to four, with as a aforementioned introduction of the library uh, and sort of their care and attention to their facility in the parking lot. Uh, and then Front Park as well, basically all Olmstead, other than the talked about the fountain feature and the, um, uh, and the uh, uh, sort of basin pool itself. Uh, and then um, the circles, really just a simple simple relationship of inside the curb, uh, city management, outside the curb where it's green, uh, Olmstead Parks Conservancy Management at both Symphony and Front. So with that, uh, really wanted to sort of again get into the get into the weeds on uh, maintenance responsibilities, but uh, would, uh, entertain any conversation uh, around this uh, public private partnership. Thoughts in the room or around? So take in the room, Debbie first. Um, could you just go back to you said we had a new um, supervisor? Or, oh yeah. At the beginning, I yeah. Guess I didn't catch that name, so I oh, just An to... Anthony White. Okay. He's so been the, he's been the foreman uh, okay. uh, covering uh, part of the system for a while, and uh, it's been elevated to run the whole. System okay. with this support staff. So if we have um, an issue, like I had um, an issue the other day with uh, trash collection, I wasn't sure who I should address it to. That would be who we should address our issues with our park to. Yep. So you, I mean, you're welcome to talk to Bob Stokes, the director of operations. He should coordinate with who runs this 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 district. Mm -hmm. um, but I think ideally, the way we like it is people develop relationships with. The head of their district, so yeah, okay. you should have Anthony's phone number. I can, I can certainly get you Anthony's okay, phone. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Why don't you just give it all to all of us? I don't know if I have it on my phone. <laughs> I, I can give it to you. I can certainly send it out. Let's see. I do have it. Do you have it, Z? Let me hold on. I can give you a number. I'm not sure. This is it's a seven one five. 715-5727. No, okay. Are you ready? 716? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. 716-609-0927. Okay. Yes. 716-609-0927. And would you agree that because they have different schedules, so like having Bob in the loop too? Okay, it's good. So then, if he let's say he's not there that day, Bob will, because Bob is basically working all the time, even if he's not on, on, even if he's not in work, and then he would delegate to someone who's working that day. Okay. Mm -hmm. So having both of them as contacts. Okay. Like good. sending them a text message both together, and also Bob is Anthony's supervisor, so it would help with accountability. Okay. Making sure that people are accountable for their roles. Good. Thank you. Any other discussion on uh, maintenance responsibilities? Yes. Yes, Mary. Okay. So the picture based park had the fountain area, right? So there's a fence around the fountain, and inside the fence are bushes. So I'm confused as to whose responsibility is it to 
take care of the bushes. All the uh, everything green is homestead. Okay. Well, okay. Yep. So yep, you can, you can, that's, that's including the weeds and the. <laughs> yes. Sadly. <laughs> Yes. All right. Uh, all okay, that is that is a good way to look at it. Yeah. Um, and then I guess I have a very specific and bizarre maintenance question, and that is um, this: the staff religiously weeds wax around the edge of the park, like where the curb meets the street, to the point where the grass along the edge now is dying. And I'm just confused as to why, why that, why that it happened. <laughs> like why they do that okay so this is uh so, so basically what's 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 happening is at the edge where you would use a weed whacker to handle anything going across the curb they're almost grinding the grass back down yeah. to its roots uh within yeah. like a six inch or the yeah it's probably yeah like that you think that yeah about that much yeah, the i don't know i haven't really looked at it yeah. but it's, uh, I, it's I'm, I'm overly yeah. sensitive to grass not growing in Days Park, as you are personally well aware. So. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that, that's, a, that's certainly just a, a behavior to correct. Um, uh, you know, and, and again, I think it's good information back to our operations team. Um, you know, we're hiring new people every year. That person just just may not may not um, you know have gotten their technique down to. The way it should be but yeah we certainly we don't want to we, we do not want to take grass down past it encroaching over a curb uh where it shouldn't be so is that then something that we should address with um anthony and bob just let them know that it's happening so that they can then pass the word down yeah you're, you're welcome to follow up this is everything that comes into this meeting you know we'll we'll okay. bring along as well but you are also welcome to, to follow up on that directly Basically, if anything that you guys send to us, we will also send it down to them. And okay. sometimes because we are more in front of our computers, we are with our phones more than they are, mm -hmm. we might be able to get to the okay. requests and Good. issues faster and mm -hmm. be able to be like, Anthony is not free today, reach out to this person. You know what I mean? That's right. what makes sense. Yeah. So from a technical or delegation standpoint, administrative staff can help, might be able to help. Okay. So, I would say if someone doesn't respond, um, reach out okay. to us. Like, there's different Absolutely. points of context, and hopefully that's um, helpful. Okay. Any other uh, details to be discussed on maintenance and the maintenance partnership? Are they coming through on uh, Zoom? Looks like there's a little bit of chat happening. Thanks. No, I can't seem to see it. Oh, it's maybe me. Oh, wait. Uh, oh, Lauren, true. Lauren, you can share whatever you want to say. Hi. I actually um, have a, a question that I'm not even sure you're going to be able to answer, but um, the reason I wanted to come to this meeting is because I live on Johnson Park, and I understand it's not part of the conservancy at the moment, but since Olmstead did have a hand in redesigning the park at one point, and because the city's maintenance of it is just so disappointing, I was wondering how we could look into getting involved with the Conservancy. Uh, that's an interesting question. That is, the, in terms of moving that along, uh, that is a little bit above uh, uh, things we can really answer here and now. Um, because our, our contractual relationship is defined to uh, park systems that were a part of the National Register nomination, um, and Johnson Park is is not part of that at this time. I think there's there's sort of several conversations. I guess we we would we would want to have. I uh, apologize. Oh, oh, no uh, no sign no sign. Councilmember Rivera you just uh, joining us. Um, <laughs> we can certainly follow up on that uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, the steps that would need to be taken, but um, you know, that would need to be added to the contract uh, with the city. Um, and we wouldn't really handle that until a renegotiation time. And then there would be sort of making the case for its inclusion based on um, historic evidence. Um, so uh, I think uh, if you uh, sort of 
let us do our due diligence and follow up on that. Um, you know, we could certainly circle back with you directly on on um, sort of how and if that could move forward. Okay. Um, a little more complicated than just saying, yeah, we'll take it. I know, <laughs> I know, of course, I, I, I know. I just didn't know where to start. Um, I reached out to our councilman, Mitch Nowakowski, and I, he's very receptive to everything, but I think he just has so much on his plate that it's just not a priority. But um, having lived here for several years and we did a huge renovation on our house and we, we love the park, but it's just, it just seems to be getting worse and worse. There's so much grass missing. There's really no curb left. Um, it's really a shame. So I, I'd like to do what I can to, to preserve it. All right. Well, yeah, well, uh, it's gotten in the notes. I'll, I'll, I'll bring this back to, uh, we get our, our, our leadership team and we'll, I'll, you know, circle back with you directly on and uh, council member Nowakowski uh, as well, I guess, in terms of. Okay. That, stand. that would be great. Should I just, um, can I put my email address in the notes or who, who could I reach out to just to further the conversation? Uh, Laura, you can put your email address in the chat and I will make sure to note it down. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Barbara, you raised your hand, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to, um, I'm sure you're not surprised, add on to Lauren's request and please consider Broderick Park um, and what all that would involve because um, the, with all the plantings that are there, the Friends of Broderick Park is, uh, it's very challenged to keep up with uh, what it needs. And in addition, I don't know if you saw the press release, but there will be a pocket park at the base of Lafayette. And some of us um, in terms of uh, Olmstead uh, vision, see that little dotted line that he made down Lafayette <laughs> does go. So that, you know, if that would possibly have an even better chance I don't know, but I just wanted to advocate for both those areas. Hi, thanks, Barbara. Uh, Jennifer from also asked if Ferry Circle would be discussed later more in the agenda, or if you have a question now, Jennifer. Yeah, I think uh, if it's a if it's a, if it's a maintenance question, um, yeah, please uh, raise it now. Okay. Jennifer, go ahead. Um, I don't know if it's a maintenance question or not. It's definitely a safety question. Um, and so I don't know whether that's something you want to hear about now. Okay. Uh, is this uh, just a, um, we've discussed this at previous meetings. It's just, just related to pedestrian safety uh, with the crosswalks, condition of crosswalks, sort of legibility and, and logic there. Or is there a, or two, um, let's, yeah, let's, just, let's, let's talk it now, talk it through now. Okay, yeah, I did bring it up at a previous meeting about how um, it's become sort of a raceway. And um, there is a sign on Richmond, just on the Northeast um, side of Richmond that says uh, a weight limit for, for vehicles. And I'm, I'm pretty doubtful that that's being um, upheld, but we also have 18 wheelers now going regularly down Ferry Street, Dollar General, McDonald's. Um, and um, I, so I don't know if it's, a, if it's a city street department. I know they've been trying to do bump, bump outs at some of the other circles but it is very unpleasant to live here now. Um, it's just constant noise, honking, screaming, um, big semi trucks, um, in, in addition to the school buses and the garbage and recycling trucks. And I don't know why they're like every day now, it's like all day long, big, big trucks. It doesn't feel like a pedestrian or bicycle friendly parkway. 
it feels like a um, highway. And I know that with them trying to figure out what to do with the Skajakwita, I'm like, this has already become the Skajakwita right in front of my house. And um, I'm actually thinking about moving because it's really just, it's stressful. It smells bad with the all the exhaust. Um, and it's really that the atmosphere has become really aggressive around the circle. And so I don't know who, who deals with that, but it um, seems pretty problematic to me. It, Jennifer, we, we do have the city in, in the uh, room here and uh, um, Taylor, I think can uh, touch on uh, maybe next steps relate to that. Yeah, so I'm in charge of the slow streets program for the city. So I evaluate all the requests for speed pumps. Um, but in terms of requests for um, improve pavement markings and things like that, for like pedestrian safety, you can submit that request to 311. And I know people hate hearing that, but there is someone on the other side that looks at it. That's me that looks at all the traffic calming requests. And we do have a formal process to evaluate and to put things in our project queue as funding becomes available for different um, like traffic coming pedestrian safety requests. So I don't know if I, I might have actually responded to your 311 request before. Somebody I think put in a 311 request for the circle as well. Um, no, I don't but, think it was me. Okay, there was someone else. Can you say again which circle it was? Very. Fair. So I know that there was, I believe maybe I talked to Councilman Rivera about ferry before, because there's some streets in the city that are designated truck routes that we wouldn't be able to put bump outs on unless we remove the truck designation. Um, so I need to, maybe later when I'm talking, I can show our slow streets website to see if like we're evaluating West Ferry or not, because I can't remember. Um, <clears throat> But there are speed humps going in a lot on the west side of the city. There's been a lot of requests for them to at least calm the traffic in the residential streets. So if you have any other questions for me, um, my email is going to be in the presentation later. So you can send me an email and I can direct you how to submit a 311 request. Okay. Great. Yeah. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stay in contact with Taylor and, and um, you know, at our next meeting be able to sort of report out um, what we find yeah. with this effort. Uh, I will note, and I did, I think uh, last meeting, note that um, Sean Ryan, uh, state senator, uh, has put in uh, for funding, uh, sort of as a general request for analysis of looking at how we can do traffic coming in all of the circles in North Buffalo. There's a lot of great work moving forward at Gate Circle. Uh, and he engaged the conservancy on starting a conversation about the rest of them. So um, you know, if that funding does come through, um, there'll be further coordination with the city on um, you know, how we best utilize uh, these resources productively. But you know, again, that's just it's just a letter in. Budget is still in the works, so we'll know more down the road. No pun intended. <laughs> Good. All right. Any other uh, any other comments specifically tying back to uh, uh, maintenance and you know again that chart of roles and responsibilities um, you know that it, it sort of was a, a timely conversation in that you know everything related to roadways in and through the Olmsted Park system is is was where we yeah. are mute Brian, uh, I would suggest that that slide get emailed to everyone because it makes it very clear what who's responsible for what. All right. Yep. Uh, so uh, it takes a little bit of time, but all of these materials, all the presentation materials, go up on the website. Um, so certainly, if you missed the meeting, know someone who missed the meeting, um, you'll be able to get at the get at the presentations after the fact. But we can certainly make the effort of just pulling out the slide into a into a one page handout kind of thing. All right, um, keeping things moving along. Um, 
this will be brief, um, but introduced the, um, that the city of Buffalo had completed uh, a really monumental step in uh, inventorying, surveying, and uh, getting, getting their arms wrapped around uh, the entire city of Buffalo park system. Uh, this is again uh, beyond Olmstead Parks, but the entire city inventory of parks. Um, this information you can go to the city's website, 2021 Parks Plan, uh, to get at the page where you can uh, view the entire document uh, through uh, story maps. There's also links to the interactive parks parks map, which is GIS based <clears throat> and can be a lot of filters. You can get a lot of great information. Uh, off of there. So there's a lot of information available. Um, it was sort of my plan to uh, share a lot of that information with this group. Uh, but as I started to go through it and think about the eight sections and put together presentation slides, uh, I was thinking I was probably going to have as many slides as there were pages in the entire document <laughs> and figured maybe this is a little more information than people want. So I want to sort of open up a conversation, you know, focused on the sections that there is a section on, you know, certainly the history of the city and, and development, but there's also a section on how the plan was done. There's a section on the current park amenities, kind of that inventory of assets, uh, a, a conversation about the comparison of our peer cities. They did a, a great analysis of several cities uh, similar to Buffalo and how we rank up against them. A conversation about the value of the parks and sort of getting into the uh, uh, finances uh, and then getting into some needs with regard to community park investment needs community priorities through their outreach and survey effort and then some details of their implementation strategy so i uh, didn't want to overwhelm everyone with sort of a an outlay but if there are things um, that people would like to hear more about um you know obviously you know, welcome to read the document yourself, but if I think it would be helpful to uh, to sort of go through this as a group, um, sort of uh, welcome uh, that feedback um, and, uh, you know, we'll turn that around in upcoming meetings. But um, so they didn't want to go through a, a very, very intensive outlay just to, you know, put people to sleep here around the table. So a little bit of a uh, Brief discussion on on sort of uh, that idea of sort of bringing this bringing this in more detail back to the group. Have you read it? Uh, I've I've read most of it. You've read most of it. Okay. Yeah. How do you think it impacts the efforts of the Buffalo and the Park Conservancy? Is it complementary or is it competitive? Uh, I think for the most part it's complementary and it uh, and it really. It doesn't go as far in the sort of what are we doing in the next five years projects wise as our five year plan. So so it it was it's a lot of great background and kind of puts puts the Olmsted Park system in better context of the rest of the parks. Whereas, you know, sometimes if you're you know the way we do it, only looking at the Olmsted parks, you could think those are the only parks and you know those are the only places available to the community. Uh, that's just our focus because they're historic parks and they're part of our mission. Um, but there is a lot of, you know, I don't want to call them supporting parks because they're, you know, equally valued park spaces within the city. Um, so having all that data, you know, crunched, I think, is a, is a valuable backdrop to what we do uh, in terms of keeping the Olmsted Park system up to date. So as we go through the next five year plan, it's, it's going to be a great value to us uh, in terms of sort of thinking deeply, even deeply even a broader brush in terms of what we want to focus on in the Olmsted Parks or, you know, what might be a better focus outside the Olmsted Parks for, you know, other advocacy uh, in other spaces. I, I read a lot of it too, and I, I agree with you. I think it's more of an encyclopedia <laughs> in terms of the city in, in, in park structure and history park structure than uh, a, a real pathway forward. I know there's a volunteer component in it, which I haven't, I don't know if it's been active, dated or not. But. Not that I'm aware okay. of. <clears throat> 
So we'll, we'll, yep. we'll, if, if you're looking for input on that, you know, it seems to me that um, a plan by the city that looks at not just the Winston parks, but also the other city parks presents an opportunity for, you know, the West end or, or the West side parks, you know, which is what we're talking about here. Um, you know, that kind of goes back to the discussion, the discussions that you led at the, at the library over here. Um, a few years ago, when you were talking about, you know, the five year plan. And, you know, uh, one of the themes that kept coming up in those meetings, I think there were three of them, was the connections between the Olmstead parks on the west side and the other city parks, especially, you know, LaSalle Park, which is, you know, now going to become, you know, Centennial Park. And, you, you know, the fact that, you know, those, I think there's like four parks, you know, Prospect, um, the Columbus Front Park, and, and LaSalle Centennial. But they're all very close together, but they don't necessarily function well together, but, but they could, and they need to function better together because there, you know, there's some things, for example, when, when people are visiting those parks or using those parks, you know, they may want to access, you know, different amenities, you know, like they might want to go across the street to get a hot dog or something like that, you know, like in Tonawanda, you know, if you're in the parks in Tonawanda, you know, you can go across the street to Mississippi Muds, you know, and, and get something, you know, get something to eat. And that sort of becomes almost like part of the park experience. But you can't really do that on the Western end, but you could, because there's areas along Porter Avenue that could probably accommodate, you know, those kinds of seasonal restaurants uh, for park users if there were better connections and if the street were easier to use and, and felt safer, you know, for people to go back and forth. Um, and also, it, it, well, and because there's people living there, you know, those kinds of seasonal restaurants could actually be sort of year round. Um, you, you know, uh, supported by the residents. But also, you know, one of the main issues is that when the Peace Bridge Plaza project happened and the state put in a bunch of infrastructure along Porter Avenue, they didn't necessarily think through very well the connections between those parks. And so one of the things we heard during that series of discussions at the library, you know, a few years ago was people were coming to meetings talking about how difficult it is to walk or bike between those parks or how even dangerous it is. So it seems like if, you know, with the city doing this plan that talks about Olmstead parks and the city parks, that there's an opportunity to maybe get that conversation about how to consider the West Side parks, you know, more almost like a group or, 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 or more seamlessly. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I don't know, I haven't been following the city park plan process really closely. So I don't know if it's in draft stage or if it's finalized or, or what opportunities we have for input. But, you know, I think those are some of the things I think we should be looking at. It's good, it, 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 is, it is finalized. Uh, I think, um, so it's, it's, it's there in, in final form to sort of view and sort of see it, but it is, as Mary says, kind of more of a, more background, more of an encyclopedia, like gives room for a path forward, um, you know, that is sort of open um, to some guidance. And I think part of the conversation today, I think uh, tangentially uh, sort of gets at some of the goals you're expressing. Uh, so when, when Taylor gets up and talks about some of the connections she's uh, looking for input on, I think you'll be, you'll be pleased to hear it's working in that direction. But certainly, uh, you know, not to go off on a, on a tangent, I think we stay on track here, but um, the way the development of Centennial Park and the new pedestrian bridge is really sort of changing the paradigm of park access and where you even won't really want to be. So, well, I think we sort of lost some key battles in terms of making Porter Avenue that great connection um, with some of that state infrastructure it's almost like now the conversation has shifted south and I think there's new opportunities to, to make those connections. So a bigger conversation for down the road. We'll talk about a little bit more of that today. Um, but a uh, great point, Alan, thanks for that. Any other uh, last thoughts 
And again, I think, you know, I'm going to bring some of this forward again through the five year planning process. So it's, it's going to come up. I don't need a lot of guidance, but again, I think the idea of, of you know, toning back my enthusiasm for sharing these sorts of things is probably warranted. <laughs> All right. So with that, uh, uh, we're going to move on to more project stuff. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn and the progress associates, I'm going to turn the floor over to Taylor Brown from City of Buffalo Engineering and talk about the Bus Dye Avenue traffic calming project. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Taylor Brown again. I am a senior engineer for the Department of Public Works. Um, you may have worked with me before when I was with the Buffalo Sewer Authority. I worked in the Niagara Street Project, some of the green infrastructure. So if my name sounds familiar, I was on the sewer side, but now I've rised up to the street level. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I know Barbara's on this call. I know I've talked to her a lot about Niagara Street and green infrastructure. So nice to see some familiar people. Um, so what I want to do today, um, the project manager for the Bus Day Act, the coming project, um, so I just wanted to go through at a high level and share what we're proposing for bus die adjacent to front park since, you know, that's part of this district meeting. So, um, the limits of our project are bus day Avenue from Massachusetts to Virginia. Um, and recently we sent out mailers to the surrounding neighborhood. So, um, to the east, all the way to Niagara Street, and then to the west, um, adjacent to Bus Dye. Um, we sent out mailers encouraging people to take a survey just so that we could get some feedback about what issues people were seeing on Bus Dye so that we can get an idea of like how we want to design the street to accommodate some of those issues. So again, I'm gonna be focusing, uh, talking mostly about some of the stuff that we're proposing um, on bus die adjacent to Front Park. So I just have this here. So um, the cross streets include Vermont, Columbus Parkway, and Porter Ave and Porter Ave, we were talking about earlier. So first thing that we wanted to show from the survey, bless you, um, was what conditions of your travel experience would you like to see improved on bus die? Um, I think we got like over a hundred responses and it was mostly people from the surrounding neighborhood, which is like what we really wanted to target was you know, the people that are living there and experiencing it the most. Um, so a lot of the people said bike lanes, 72% uh, of people wanted to see bike lanes. Um, let's see what other stats I can get here. 51% of people wanted to see sidewalk improvements. Um, people had a lot of other ideas of like things that they would like to see that weren't options here. So <laughs> saying that they were seeing issues with speeding, drag racing, um, ATV dirt bike driving, um, fences, trees, plants, bump outs, um, lane reduction, um, crosswalk improvements. Um, yeah, so it was very few people that said leave everything as is. They said that they're so, they said need to be improved. But a lot of other suggestions, so I'll talk through those more later. But um, another question that we asked in the survey is do you support adding these road features? So the main things that we were talking about in our project, bike lanes, bump outs, um, which I'll talk more about like what the bump outs would look like for this project later. Uh, repainting crosswalks and stop bars and speed humps. Um, so a lot of people in favor, um, let's see. most respondents supported at least one of these improvements. Um, let's see, anything else I can glean from this? Mostly people are in favor of the things that we were proposing in terms of road features. Um, and then we asked the question of, what would make this project a win for bus die? And this was a write in question. Um, so we kind of categorize what people wrote in into these different categories. So we can kind of see like, what was the, the things that people want the most. The number one was speed mitigation, followed by safety bike lanes. Um, and you know, like these other things that come after that are all things that would help with like safety and pedestrian safety as well. So um, speed and pedestrian safety were the top things. So based on those survey results, 
I wanted to look at what the existing conditions are and then show uh, a proposed lane configuration for the portion of the park that's adjacent to bus dive. So you can see here, I have it zoomed in. So that's bus day up heading southbound, there's front park um, and the uh, multi-use path that's in the park that runs along bus dive. Um, so just like cutting it down simply, we have for our project within the right of way, 40 feet of width that we have to work with of like what we're proposing to do. Um, so what do we do with that existing 40 feet? Right now we have a parking lane and two travel lanes southbound and that's it. So we're trying to think of what can we do to better use that 40 feet. So this is the proposed lane configuration um, that we would like to do adjacent to the park. So it'd be reducing the parking lane to eight feet, still maintaining um, two travel lanes southbound, but slightly reducing the width. Um, but by doing that, we're able to have um, a protected bike lane on the west side, west side, uh, one going southbound and one going northbound. Um, and the checkered line that you see is a two foot buffer with paint um, to you know, delineate where bikes should be versus cars. Um, so we'll move on to what I was talking about before with the bump out. So these are to create um, pedestrian safe spaces uh, for intersections. So um, extending the curb line out into the streets so that people have um, more room and also are more visible to cars as they're making uh, crossings. So this is an older rendering. So this bump out is a little bit bigger than what we're proposing because this old rendering, it only showed one lane southbound. Um, but we are still proposing a little bit smaller bump outs um, going out to the width of like the parking lane that's on that one side. Um, so those are still included in the plan, but they're just like a little bit smaller, but it's still, you know, to increase pedestrian safety for like the crosswalks that, you know, cars can see them and they can see cars and it makes it safer. Um, you also see the bike lanes on the side. So heading north and southbound. So it'll look very much like that with the uh, buffer striping in between those. Um, another thing, since there were so many people in the survey that said about speed mitigation and like before what I mentioned, I'm in charge of the slow streets program for the city with the speed humps. Um, that is something that we would like to do for this project as well. Um, looking at the traffic volumes for bus die, it's definitely possible. Um, you know, there's a few things that we look at when we're installing speed humps is yeah, the traffic. I'm sorry. Yep. Did you say speed humps for bus die avenue? Yes. We were told that we couldn't do speed humps on bus die avenue because of truck traffic. Right. So that's what I'm like reevaluating with this is if we're able to remove, from what I see, there's not the truck lane. Uh, truck designation for it, and the volumes are low enough. To, right. That but only when there's them. an overflow at the bridge, they open up that gate uh, to Bus Dye Avenue, and they let trucks down, even though they're not mm -hmm. supposed to. They do open up the gates. Uh, if it's backed up on the throughway, they open up the gates on Bus Dye Avenue, and they let truck into the neighborhood. At least for those that live on Bus Dye Avenue, Columbus Parkway, they, they've seen that. I mean, I've seen it. I mean, it's just bumper to bumper of trucks going down bus diagonally. <clears throat> so I, I wouldn't know that from like the data yeah. that I looked at. So that's helpful. Um, you know, we just saw that with like the survey results, like speed mitigation was like a number one thing that people wanted resolved. So you know, we're going to have our component of speed back. pumps. Trust yeah. me, because uh, yeah. I've, no, I've asked public works to consider it. And that's one of the reasons they told me it couldn't be done. So it's interesting. Yeah, I guess, you know, I've only been at DPW for a few months. So I don't sure, know if those sure. conversations happened before. <laughs> but from my perspective, it's something we want our consultant to evaluate okay. as part of this design. Yeah. I, I have a question. Yeah. Why two lanes southbound? We've um, seen it creates a need for people to race, right? Well, what we're hoping with 
you know, some of like these bump outs and like the bike configuration is we are narrowing the lanes. And so that kind of causes like a mental thing where people feel like squeezed in a little bit and slowing down. So we're hoping that helps with speed mitigation as well, like that landscaping, like that narrowing. Um, but in terms of like the volumes that are seen on the street, like we had to maintain two lanes. What are the volumes? I don't have the data in front of me right now, but I can get it to you. Like, like a, a daily traffic basis. Is yeah, so DOT provides like a volume count um, to the state that you can find online. I mean, is it like over 10,000 cars per day? 15,000? Anything like that? See, the average I mean, is, is, it like is like 3,000 to 4,000 or something? 4,000? Mm -hmm. It doesn't, that doesn't seem like what would justify two lanes. <laughs> I can send some data back, look back at the design report to see what volumes were used to justify the two lanes. Yeah, it would be, you know, I'm sure you've looked at this, but, you know, whether those numbers would be COVID. Um, well, it's actually it's interesting. 50 years. <laughs> Lefty's been that wide for 50 years or whatever. It's always been two lanes. You know, you come off the throughway and then you got residential streets turning that way. I mean, it's a main thoroughfare to get to Busty to get back to the Peace Bridge. And you can't just make it a one lane street with a bike lane on it. I mean, it's just... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's a wide street. I mean, change everything. Yeah, it, I understand where she's coming from. She lives it. I live on Columbus. Yeah, especially talking about like some of the trucks that might be there. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, it's yeah. a main thoroughfare practically. Right. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else like this. Does this represent, um, you go back to the graphic Sorry. businesses, do things <laughs> change dramatically um, in areas not adjacent to the park, or is it? Uh, is, um, is it is so, in some the portions, point? like the bike movements move to like the other side of the street, so more typical, you know, north and southbound on like the adjacent curves. Um, but for this part of the project they are like together in like a connected <coughs> there's also the whole big bike lane in the park there that whole concrete thing well you walk on it but if you look in the park that whole blacktop thing is a whole bike thing that you can ride around the park on your bike right. or a stroller or yeah roller so I, think skates it's like, or, I mean it's huge there yeah. wide open i think it's just like <laughs> providing options for people if they want like a more leisurely one versus like having like a quicker commute because this does connect people all the way from Medgar Street to like downtown by Virginia. Yeah. So it's just kind of creating that like straight, you know, like commuters route like for bicycles is the idea. And, and this is only in front of the sub, in front of front park. This is the plan to go straight down plus to Virginia, I like you said the end of Virginia. Yeah, the project limits Massachusetts. Part from Massachusetts to Virginia. With the two oh, okay. bike lanes and all that stuff. So what I'm focusing on for this presentation was just like adjacent to the park, but other parts of the project have bike lanes going um, in the more typical fashion along like the curves, for, like for the northbound and southbound side. Um, so yeah, it's not like that protected bike lane all the way through. And you use word protective. Um, I know Niagara Street has protected bike lanes. It's not to that extent. All okay. we have here is like a painted buffer okay. to like separate where cars should be and bike should be. It's not to the extent of like curving and things like that. Well, your, your, your graphics seem to show flexible poles as well. Um, no. I don't believe this is part of the design anymore, so I apologize for showing that. That's the only rendering that I had was mm -hmm. from before. Um, but it is the painting. I mean, certainly, I mean, just looking at the fact that you're not even taking away a travel lane and you're able to put in a cycle track protected just shows how wide these existing lanes are. Yeah. It's probably inducing all the speed. So just, yeah, like just you narrowing, said, narrowing things, things down. down where cars should be is helpful. Because this is something that's come up in previous meetings here is this issue of, of drag racing down as well as issues with it inside the park. Yeah, so I've received a 311 request asking for speed humps within the park as well, because there are people yes. that's yeah, the out there. Yeah, so um, 
speed humps is like where we started the program was in the parks throughout the city. So it is something that we're gonna look into, but it's a different like process to put those in versus like the residential street. So still figuring that out. Um, why would, just why we're on speed humps, I don't, and you're talking about the park. Um, and that has been one of the major complaints that I receive is the drag racing within the park, the motorcycles, Mm -hmm. And it was a matter of public safety uh, as well, because we had kids in the park, you have, this, right. whether they're playing, they're playing soccer or they're at that little playground. Yeah. And mm -hmm. my feeling was that was soup. I mean, I think we needed to move that along this year, but it's not going to get done until next year. Um, but I think of all the things that, we, that I'm working with public works, I think, um, doing something at front park with regards to the boulders the speed humps i think that's that's a priority because that's public safety mm -hmm. and that's actually, we that's, have videos and pictures from residents of all kinds of activities at the park um, and to the point where even the police had a hard time getting people out of the park i mean we have videos from people that across the street on bus down avenue and there's literally close to 100 cars or more within the park. So that's a huge parking lot. I mean, it's, it's a huge, huge parking lot, lot yeah. where that statue was. Uh, yeah, I'm glad, I'm just dish. hopeful that we identify the funds to get that done. Yeah. I think that's a matter of public safety. Yeah, because looking at Front Park versus like some of the other parks that we put speed humps in, like the circle, like in Delaware Park where it's just like right. the circle that we put them, it's difficult with like the parking lot because I know that's like where a lot of the issues are with like, you know, drag race. So I think we just have to like work with our consultant to identify like what would work there in terms of speed humps, like if we're only able to do it at the entrance, but if there's other things that we can do like this in the parking lot. Well, the so is this, so is, this conversation is the next. Okay, yeah. sorry, go ahead. So we can get into the details. Okay. We bring them up once we get through here. Yeah, no, so I didn't have much else. Um, if you have more questions about the project, if you can email me, uh, busti at buffalony.gov. I do actually check that email. Um, and my uh, personal email, if you want it, tbrown at buffalony.gov as well. Um, you can also join our project outreach list. Um, so if you go to our website, uh, busti traffic coming, um, you can sign up for updates um, as the project progresses. Yeah. Anyone on the web have any questions? Okay. Is, there, is there money? Is there money? Oh, is there there? Any money? Money is there. It's happening. Right. All right, great. On the northern end, on the northern end where that flows into Massachusetts, there's a part of an Olmstead circle uh, there. Um, is, is that something the city is looking at, sort of enhancing or, or bringing back? Is it like that half circle that, like, there's a path that goes on right. the edge of it? That's yeah. part of this as well. It's like figuring out, like, a bike path to that. If I'm, if I'm thinking of the same thing you want. Do, do, you, do you have, like, a preliminary, preliminary plan for that? I assume you'd be yes. doing that with the conservancy. Is it a historic feature? Uh, Maybe we're talking about the different ones, but but in Massachusetts, Brian, you you probably remember what the name of that was? The bank. The bank. That's it. The, you had the bank. Take it to the bank. <laughs> we'll yeah. the bank. The bank. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it's because it's right up there by the the river bank. Yeah. So yeah, I mean we'll, we'll be we were excited to get this presentation and have Taylor join us. We're going to be staying engaged and say anyone who wants to dive into the details get connected here, um, but certainly as the project progresses, we'll be bringing yeah. updates back. Yeah, so we've sent the plans to them to review as well. So they're they're aware. And I, I'm just not sure of what section that you're talking about. So. Sure, in Massachusetts and the uh, bus day, right? Massachusetts bus day, yeah. Right in front yeah. of Paxville Park. Yeah, okay. so like this little circle here? Yes. Yeah, so that's part of this project as well, because we're proposing to follow this along for like the bike improvements as well. And are you connecting the two way cycle track up with the one on Niagara Street that's part of the um, We're trying to connect it to the um, river trail that's here. So 
following this and like connecting it up that way. So, so if you're on the, the protected bike lane, the, the new two way cycle track on Agger Street, um, would there be a seamless connection or is there? Well, I believe that Niagara Street protected bike lane goes to that off trail Riverside Park. Like it goes at um, Niagara and Busside, like where they join. Yeah. Um, it comes off the road and directs traffic onto that off trail. Okay. Yep. Um, in, in just about the two lane configuration, it just doesn't seem like with those traffic volumes that two lanes are justified. And it, it's interesting that your original design was was for a one lane, which seems to me like it was that was the right impulse. I mean, you know, I don't know exactly what happened, but the impression I would have after seeing that and then hearing that you switch back to a two-way configuration is that at some point somebody saw the one lane like maybe the two three majority people or or somebody and said uh, i don't think that's going to work you know you need to take it back to two lanes and we took it back to two lanes but personally i it doesn't seem like the traffic number is justified two lanes i i think you should, i think you should seriously look at a single lane but i think i i think I'm, you know we just changed traffic on, on forest and to uh, allow for bike lanes and taking away parking spots uh, from people and a bump out that fire trucks and garbage trucks have run over already. And I've never received so many calls yelling and screaming about changing and it was temporary. We wanted to see. I mean, uh, right, go it's bike. Temporary. It's temporary. Go yeah. bike and Department of Public Works. But we received so many complaints, uh, and the residents were very upset. So, when you talk about traffic and data and that kind of information, I think we need to take a very close look when we change the flow of. I mean, you want to go one, one lane. We have to be very careful with that. Um, and I like to kind of not not happen what happened on forest where people are just upset like you wouldn't believe i mean i'm sure somebody's called you've probably heard about it yeah. my office has heard about it tracy we, we i'm sorry we need to be doing a kind of experimental design on bus sky try testing out before it's permanent oh. okay <laughs> you, you could definitely try that in rochester we did that with a major street traffic coming or road diet you know where we went out and we you know we put temporary barriers to narrow it down to a single lane and then you know took very careful uh notes along with the city about how it worked and mm -hmm. all that kind of thing so you know that might be worth it I, I, I agree with what the councilman said about forest avenue i think one of the differences here is you're you're taking a very good careful considered approach and my personal feeling and observation and what i've heard people about the forest project is there wasn't enough engagement on that project but, you know i know i'm a stakeholder in nature street stuff and i checked early on when i heard about that i thought to go bike and i said you know how can i get involved would be part of an advisory committee on this and they, they just sort of they just sort of give me the brush off so it's almost like well we're just you know, we're just going to do our thing we're going to test this out and then they, they did that and it it blew up yeah. All right, let's uh, get know, back sorry. on track here. Uh, we've got only got 15 minutes left in the meeting, and I got a lot of agenda. Fortunately, we great conversation as always. Um, but uh, moving things along, uh, so just basically moving into the park with the same conversation. Um, we've received uh, an updated set of uh, of uh, plans from the consultant with regard to the plans for perimeter security. Again, this is keeping vehicles off of lawn areas, which is becoming a major issue in a lot of the Olmstead parks, and as well dealing with the plaza itself. Um, the last time we talked about this, the four major takeaways uh, from our last meeting, again, three months ago in this room, not this room, actually, um, was related to edits to include a fence. Uh, again, the detail, you know, 
will be attractive. We'll develop a design standard, but a fence separating the playground from the park road. Again, it's a form of barrier. Uh, concern and operation about a gate. The proposal is for a arm to come down to close the park at night. Um, this uh, details related to that is the plan is for it to be a solar powered. Uh, it will be one that comes down at time, but if you are in the park and you need to leave, as you approach it from the back, it will raise and let you out. So you will not get trapped in the park, uh, but it will sort of clearly designate the park getting closed. Um, he also, the, the conversation was about the original location it was a little bit further up the road. Uh, they're recommending moving that. Actually, I've got close up slides for me to talk. I'll, I'll go to better slides and we'll show the details on this. But the gate was a question. Uh, support for the speed tables on the plaza. So we'll flow close, close in in terms of sort of finding a way to um, sort of subdivide the large parking lot area. Uh, and then the recommendation to incorporate trees uh, along Busti, um, which is pretty much barren of trees, um, the entire length sort of uh, build a natural element into the uh, uh, perimeter security. So going place by place, again, these are draft. I've got my little markups on here, you know, the talk about the staging area getting moved and some other things. But um, again, sort of the idea is a speed table around the Perry Monument and then kind of cutting across the plaza, subdividing into three areas, um, which will obviously not solve the problem of, you know, you can certainly drive within your little corner, um, but it does, I think, deal with the larger issue of the, the circling and, you know, I think will will deter a significant amount of the ongoing issue out there. Um, just moving through these areas, then again, the idea of, of installation of trees along bus dye, um, details to get worked out. Um, but again, boulders all along bus dye Avenue on the inside of that of that um, bike path, <clears throat> bike path. And then at the entrance, uh, moving that gate closer to the road so that it doesn't allow people into the park and out of sight, but in but outside the gate. Um, so this will require people if they come up and the park is closed, you won't have your your tail in traffic, um, but you will need to make a three point turn to get yourself out of the park um, in that little oh, stub hi. of roadway. Um, <clears throat> um, so just comments about adding in bollards, realigning some things, but again, this includes a significant amount of boulders around the perimeter of the park um, that are really going to, um, you know, where enforcement was on its own in terms of keeping people off. This really provides physical barriers to support enforcement, um, um, basically securing the park and um, you know, people who uh, are enjoying green space safe from intruding uh, vehicles. So uh, it's, uh, it's fairly extensive. Uh, my understanding is it is earmarked for funding uh, and will occur next year uh, through the great work of the council member and um, just any comments back. Um, this, is, this is version three. So it is, I think, approaching um, uh, uh, if not final format, um, uh, final draft format. So, uh, um, other than uh, one comment, uh, uh, running into one of the neighbors, Tina, out in the park after the uh, meeting, where she was wondering if this could be some way phased, so we didn't have to do 100% barriers uh, right off the bat and see if maybe the gesture deters. Um, that is something I brought to the city. Uh, they're hesitant to, you know, not spend this money all in one flush because, you know, resources, you know, if you stretch things too far, they sometimes get pulled away. Um, but um, that can be something we continue to have a conversation of. It's sort of the jarring effect of um, this this much um, this 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 many boulders is uh, remains a concern of the community. So some. Quick conversation about this uh, and thoughts moving forward. I think it's really paired with uh, efforts along Busti Avenue related to community concerns. You know, seems like we're really able to address a lot of these issues. 
Yeah, this is more than I can do with speech hubs. So sorry. This is more than I can do with speech hubs. This is actually going to address the real issues. So yeah. Thoughts, feelings. All right. Great. Um, moving into some quick updates. Prospect Pathways is under construction. Uh, if you've been out there, you've seen we've started the work on the uh, um, what was Columbus Park side, uh, no longer called Columbus Park, but the uh, uh, west side. Is it Prospect Park or West Side Park? Prospect. Prospect Park. Yep. Yep. It was so, all Prospect Park. It's all it back to Prospect. Back to the, yeah. Prospect Park. Okay. Back to the original name. Uh, the great news about this project is it came in under budget, which is shocking uh, for anything this time of year. So we have some extra money, and I am here to ask, what are some ideas of how we spend extra money? I'll uh, match the concrete in the base park circle. Okay, we can't go off-site. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. What about doing some work in the shelter? Yeah. Uh, so it's, about yeah, so it's, it, isn't, it isn't that much money. Um, you know, <laughs> that is that is a major project. There is some initial work the city is going to be undertaking uh, on the next slide. An update on that. Do you have? Um, I mean, do you put the recycling boats in those? Um, the real nice decorative the enclosures. Okay. Enclosures, yeah. Yeah, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars. Well, so, I mean, well, can, cost a all all ideas. Yeah, those, that, that, that's a good one, but. How many benches are in the park? Um, so as a part of this project, we are already putting, I want to say 13. Oh, benches wow. Okay. In the park. We're replacing all of the benches with the Homestead Standard. And um, yeah, I want to say, I want to say maybe even more than that. Maybe yeah, if Do you consider public art as well? Public art. Barbara is asking bike racks and bike repair stations. Bike racks, you care. <clears throat> is there a statue for the plinth um, that Columbus graced at one time? Is there a statue plan to go there? Yeah, uh, yeah I've, got, I've got a brief update um, uh, on your agenda. There's no major update, uh, but I will, I will cover that. Okay. Uh, Codes, uh, bike. Well, in London, they have a plinth that you they routinely change the statue on. Like it's not like they have an artist come into statue and they leave there a while, then they have another artist come and I thought that would be kind of fun. But All right, I got toad enclosures, bike racks, public art. Trees. Something, something. Sorry. Yeah. More trees. 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 Excellent. And all Historic. Okay. I like all these ideas. Yeah. 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 Historic signage about Valerie and the history of the park. Yeah, we actually, yeah, that was one of the things I brought up as uh, we need to replace the signs, even just the park ID signs. Um, one said Columbus on it, so that got out, and the other one got run over by a car. So uh, that was done. <laughs> no, it would be, and we did this. The Carol uh, Perlman got run over. Over at Broderick Park. With there's this little thing you look overlooking the lake where it talks about the history mm -hmm. yeah. of, of the park. I mean, if you stand on the corner and you look at the armory, it's one of the most magnificent. Yeah. It's, it's just lovely. All right, great. Those are all great ideas. Exactly what I was hoping to get out of this conversation. Uh, but this project will be progressing. Uh, the lion's share of it will be done by this fall. Um, uh, but again, these little add-ins, um, you know, might be part of a, like a second, uh, second, second flush. Um, City of Buffalo uh, has got money for to start the work within the Prospect Shelter building. Um, getting work started within buildings can be a very laborious process. Uh, it is uh, likely at this point in time. Um, getting rebid for a 2023 construction start. Uh, but this will start the process of you know, getting investment in that building that's required to uh, um, uh, um, at least start the process of restoration okay. so it can be uh, kind of so it can be occupied uh, by folks again. So again just a brief update on that. 
covering a few very quick issues. Um, throughout the park system, we've been just uh, sharing information with regard to any homelessness within the park issues. Um, so again, we had this conversation, had it at uh, MLK uh, and um, um, the um, captain, Tom Champion, was able to join me there uh, and said something which was very important, which I had neglected at the previous meeting, which is um, this is not, you're not calling to get people arrested. You're not calling to get people in trouble. Um, these types of call through both the non-emergency line, 311 line, or even just calling 911, you know, to sort of get these things on record. Uh, the response is behavioral health unit. So it gets these people the help they need. Um, again, they do not get arrested. They do not get taken to jail. Um, it gets people who, uh, you know, are in the unfortunate situation of sleeping in the park is their best option, gets them the support that they need. Um, so it's really important that, um, you know, we um, um, act on anything we see out there and, um, you know, make these, make these calls. So the Conservancy is obviously the front line on these sorts of things, but anyone who sees anything, um, you know, we encourage this sort of outreach. Brian, did they talk about, um, do they have people at night available in the Hammer Health Unit? And it's unfair to ask you that question because you're not DPC. They, but, are adding, um, they are adding more hours. They're adding more hours? Because our issue is um, in the evening issue. In yes, I think your city of Buffalo budgeted more money for mental health. Okay. Yeah. To go along with the police department. So there's a they get called the district police meeting. Meeting. Hmm? There's a district meeting for the police that I went. Yeah, I did time. call, I did call, well, I'll talk to you, but I called last night because someone was in the park last night. Yeah, that's a good question. Hours hasn't come up, so I'll, I'll find out about that. Um, related to the Columbus Monument site, um, the next step is further coordination between the Arts Commission and the uh, Italian American Federation. Uh, the Arts Commission that just got a report back today, they have not received any of that detail. So that, you know, would again trigger more community conversation, but, but nothing has been brought to the table yet. So we're still waiting um, to see next steps. She brings some of this stuff from the new cultural center. <laughs> oh. We've got enough over there. Maybe, so, maybe, maybe Russell, 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 no, 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 no. Maybe Russell so much and just get some of this salt or some of this. <laughs> I, don't, this yeah, there. I don't want any <laughs> white gravel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you want this not to leave there. <laughs> So, um, so, the, so the decision was was definitely made to replace the statue and not just take all this out of the park. No, it's to replace it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, I mean, it, nothing is proposed at this point, so that will open up the conversation. Um, but the I, but sort of the direction it's it started on is the idea of something less less based on Columbus and more sort of a familial. Mm -hmm. Um, representation of sort of cultural heritage of the neighborhood. So, yeah. so there'll be lots of opportunity to weigh in on the direction, uh, but nothing has really been proposed to respond to yet. Okay. Um, Hutchinson Chapel came up last meeting. Um, uh, there was some conversation about, you know, follow up with uh, uh, the, the um, city inspectors. Uh, it's been confirmed that this is a state property. Uh, and the direction we need to head is is in response to state level um, information. So um, that's kind of where it stands. We don't have answers, but we're continuing working with the council member's office. We've asked getting, getting the inspectors answers. department to take them to court, believe it or not. But the public register? No, the state. The owns. state. Oh. And, you okay. know, they're not maintaining the building the way they should and we don't want demolition by neglect mm -hmm. uh, the roof you can see that uh, there's problems with the roof and if there's a problem with the roof okay. there's a problem problem on the inside yeah. so we've asked uh, our permits and inspections to um, let the state know because it is embarrassing this is a state building and it's a historic landmark and they should be taken care of so there i don't know they did pull out Pull off all of the staging ground, whatever the staging ground they had there, 
all the concrete, all the asphalt. They removed it and they uh, planted grass, which is great. We appreciate that. We'd like to keep that permanent green space. Um, but we've asked the state to please make it public green space, period. Uh, we don't want it uh, for any future expansion at all. We, we feel that these bridges stay right where they're at right now on the other side of Bus Avenue and not encroach any further into the neighborhood. Uh, but we would like to stay, and we're going to stay on top of this. And wherever we have an audience, we're going to talk about this. Um, and we'll see if Kathy Volk or somebody from whoever Empire State Development will finally put money into this building. And it should, it, 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 it's sad, it should be lit up at night. I can see lights coming through the window, a beautiful building. Mm -hmm. And that's what it should be in the neighborhood. So yeah, we'll see what we can get the state to do. If it was on by the two bridges already there, so they have money. <laughs> I'd rather the state own it, Peace Bridge. Yeah, it, it's a, um, a separate authority that has no. As long as they're in debt, they continue yeah, to exist. Yeah. They work in, in secret. We don't want Ron Rhinus owning any more of our city. Just a few uh, exciting announcements. In Front Park, we uh, set a Guinness World Record uh, this past summer with the longest line of pink flamingos. People got very excited and were doing their best impression of a flamingo here. Uh, so fun stuff. It's part of our 200th celebration of Homestead. Uh, we also, since our last meeting, uh, made, made uh, some headway at, in Days Park with a couple of volunteer events, one a cleanup, and then a, uh, a planting project and bed preparation event in June and anticipated uh, additional events. Uh, we did lose our volunteer coordinator uh, following this event at the end of June. <laughs> Um, I don't that, think they're related. It, not because of I it. don't think they're related, Brian. I was just, I was just <laughs> teeing up that um, we have a new volunteer coordinator. Christy Munson uh, was uh, hired last month, uh, and she is looking to set another volunteer event in the district back at Front Park at the playground on September 17th um, from 9 to noon. Um, she will also be, uh, you know, the point of contact and re-engaging uh, Days Park uh, on future, the Days Park community on uh, future projects. Um, uh, so exciting things to come. Christy's got a great, great personality for the uh, job, knows a lot about um, landscaping. We're actually interviewing her for the specialty gardener position, and she had such a good, um, you know, sort of outward facing people skills um, and um, sort of found that she'd be a great fit. So she's got a lot of know-how, um, which is great. Uh, and upcoming events, um, not in this district. Uh, well, actually, yes, in this district up in Riverside uh, in uh, D1A, um, but uh, first in Cass Park, got a couple family movie nights coming up. Um, it seems like the one uh, September 23rd, still tentative on, uh, whether the Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings will be the movie, um, but uh, uh, some fun stuff to make note of <laughs> out in the park system. So well, don't forget Parkside Movies in the Meadow. Parkside Movies in the Meadow, yeah. okay. So that is organized by the Parkside Community Association and yep. it's by the Parkside Launch. Yeah, and I put an article about that on Buffalo Rising. All right, so great. Yeah, is check out. Rising. And the movies are every Friday in every Friday evening in August. All right, every Friday in August. Uh, check out uh, Buffalo Rising, and I think probably through the PCA you can find out the list of movies. Yeah, there. Um, so we are over time, but uh, there is certainly an opportunity if people have other burning issues to get on the table. Um, welcome. Uh, any discussion? Uh, actually, no, we're not over time. That clock is fast. We have one minute left. <laughs> so, one minute left. Any uh, sort of final thoughts or any concerns we want to bring up? Yes, Mary. <laughs> um, I'm only speaking as a resident of 17 Days Park. And I do not understand 
Well, first of all, let me say the concrete work in the end of Days Park at Cottage is quite, probably some of the best concrete work I've ever seen in the city of Buffalo. However, even though the Parks Department and streets and engineering are within the same division of the city called Public Works. They only did half of a circle around the Burham area. So now we have mismatched. We have this lovely surface of three, like a roughly three quarters of it depth. And then the other fourth is broken and over probably 25 years old. And I, I'm a just, what's the word I want? Confused, I'm confused. At a loss. I'm at a loss for why these two pieces of the Department of Public Works cannot seem to speak to each other or coordinate with each other. But the work is good. You're not my council member, I'll stop looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> So I would ask that the Buffalo Homestead Parks Conservancy to, to take this up as uh, an issue with the Design Review Committee. I think a letter could be written. I would. I am also, as a member of the Park Flock Club, going to ask them to do the same thing. Write a letter of just confusion as to why this would happen. Yeah, I don't. I don't recall us, any of us getting responses to the no. initial round of comments. No. Well, I. I do know when we had our initial meeting when the issue was brought up of the aggregate concrete that they said they that uh, Nolan Skipper at that point, from what I recollect, said that he was relatively sure they could get that area done, but he at that point in time said he didn't think they were going to do the whole circle. Yeah, and they did, and and they did aggravate aggregate mm -hmm. aggravated. <laughs> Um, and it looks really great. And I just am a little. I just, I think, I think that that was never in their plan to do it initially. I understand that. So I think that. But they, but they work in the same part. They're part of the same division. Oh, I understand call. that. I just think they, I just think that their response is that that was not their original right. plan. Right. I did ask, like, how can we make it? Like, how can we make this happen? And then um, mm -hmm. that didn't get it. That didn't get Yeah. Okay. But I think if there's enough voices of concern and confusion, it could get done. They, the guys that did the work were so, so adamant about doing a good job that they did it, and then they dug it up and did it again. Well, because some idiot came by and was smearing her hands in it. And I'm not talking about somebody that's nine or 10. It was somebody that was like in her mid thirties out there putting her, like searing what they, while it was drying. Oh. But they did it again. They, yeah. They, and then, you know, and then I, they came and sealed it after that. Yeah. They really did a good job. Yeah. It is really a good job. And they put Medina sandstone in where the Medina sandstone was. They put um, granite at, at the Days Park and Cottage at the opposite end. I mean, it's not just a concrete curb. They really, they, they really did, did they a good job. Good. Now we'll see what happens. Paving <laughs> <laughs> is now going on. Yeah. Well, supposedly. Well, they have to start bringing a machine to our street one, today and park it under a tree. <laughs> We're going to resurface, not repave. We're going to resurface the street. Uh, yes. Mill and overlay? Yes. Yeah. We did ask for, you know, the sewers are collapsing and they're from 1861, we think. Don't you think they need those? They told me that they looked at it with the camera and that it didn't. They don't normally remove the sewers until they break or collapse. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's, that was yeah. kind of the yeah. response that I got. So we need to make sure everything actually buys the insurance. They don't touch them. Yeah. <laughs> any, yeah. any final, uh, <laughs> final thoughts? Well, just about the shelter. Um, what is the city envisioning doing with this? Uh, so we're we're actually going to be uh, re-engaging uh, community conversation on the future of that. Okay. Um, there is sort of within that building, uh, the front is fairly well set up for men's room, ladies' room, and just sort of entrance foyer. But the back, there is sort of a flexible space 
um, where we'll have more of a conversation. So we don't have money lined up for uh, the reconstruction, but in advance of that, it's on one of, one of our top priorities. Um, we're going to be uh, sort of through this, and maybe in addition to the OCA, uh, be continuing conversation about um, what we want to do in that space. Um, in preparation for that body. Um, so, so look for that in meetings to come uh, and outreach through this group. Um, so we're, we're sort of at the infancy stage of, of uh, making those decisions, but there's a lot of opportunity in that building. And it's in a great spot. So I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer once we can get it, get, get, get the funding in place. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. All right. Well, um, well, thank you very much to everyone uh, here and on Zoom. Um, and uh, our next meeting is uh, scheduled for October 12th. Uh, this meeting got pushed a little bit late, so it's actually a pretty short time period between this meeting and the next. Um, but we are going to continue a conversation about the future meeting of this group, whether four times a year uh, is too much. We have seen a little bit of a drop in attendance. So we'll be talking about format of whether twice a year we're doing more of an elaborate newsletter, uh, for lack of better words, and only meeting twice a year, or if we're continuing uh, to meet four times a year. So uh, information to come, but uh, thanks for making it out today. Thank you. All right. Thanks everybody on Zoom too. See you next time. So um, hopefully after that meeting, um, Dee's having surgery. So, um, which she had scheduled. So, 